We've got Professor Vikram Soni with us. Vikram Soni has come up with this idea for sustainable cities. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this all started when um, we went to a meeting held by the Dalai Lama on, on cognition, on neuroscience, and on traditional Hindu practices of meditation. And I was just looking and hearing what people are doing. They do a lot of experiments with all kinds of brain waves and they look at states of the mind and what is happening. It was a little clinical. And um, when you look at these things or the state of the union, it's actually body, mind and spirit at any time for a human being. And for any living organism actually one of the things that we know is that and any organic living being, it doesn't matter whether it's a plant, a tree, a cockroach, or we, actually keeps all its parameters steady, like its body temperature, like its pressure, like the trace elements, like the plasma. And if anything goes a little bit off balance, like for your temperature, if it goes up by two degrees or down by two degrees, you're sick. Now, what does the body do, actually? We have a certain energy input, which is just food. And the rest the body does. It keeps you cool. You know, it keeps you cool by evaporation in the summer, like now. And it keeps you cool by burning and producing heat in the winter. So just to give you, this is called homeostasis. So one of, one of, one of the basic things about life is that life keeps a steady state with a very small input at any level from the smallest living organism to the largest but the interesting thing is the planet does the same thing because when you look at the planet it's getting a little bit of energy from the sun the solar constant like today it's a bit heavy but about you know effectively something like 2.4 watts per square meter which is but watts means per second and the planet maintains the atmosphere at 79% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and small fractions of other gases, argon, carbon dioxide, and so on. It maintains the salt level in the seawater at a constant level by throwing out salt in evaporite basins. It does a whole slew of things, much more. And it's actually even more interesting as an organism because we, whatever we eat, we have to throw out every day and we put it on the planet. But the planet doesn't have anywhere to put its waste. So it has to recycle its waste by having natural cycles. Right. But it maintains its a steady state. Okay, now these are two examples on two widely different scales. From the microscopic to our scale all the way to the planet. Why should a city not be like that? That was the question that we started with. And so Romy asked me to do a little bit of work on it. Uh, Romy uh, is an architect. Romy Khosla, yes, 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 yes. So, what we started to do with the city is to try to look and see how self-sustaining could we make the city with a minimal amount of energy input. So now what do you need in a city? You need that the city should try and control its temperature a little bit because we get very hot in the summer and cold in the winter. Some of the food supply that comes in should be grown in the, in the city, like vegetables, like milk. So we designed a city and one of the things which I'm just forgetting since we have now arrived here on the Yamuna floodplain is that we are running out of water. You know, all our groundwater in Northwest India is more or less has been exploited and mined. All aquifers have fallen between 10 to 30 meters and they are not much deeper. And all the rivers like this one, as you see, it has only a little over the meter of depth in most places and it's about 60 meters wide. And the river, 74% of its water is extracted for agricultural use and for use in cities, like a huge city of Delhi. So we've run out of river water, we've run out of groundwater, so we need a new source of water and we mustn't make the same mistake that we've made with all our resources millions of years of evolution. We are destroying them. And the floodplain is a very interesting 
um, uh, evolutionary resource. As I said, that when you look around here, for five kilometers on each side, for 30 million years, sand has been deposited right. by the flooding every season. See, this Gamana is at least 30 million years old because the Himalayas are about 55 million years old. And it has changed course and it's deposited sand. So we have wide flood plains for the Himalayan rivers because of the monsoon when water is rushing down and it brings in a lot of uh, soil and silt and sand and then deposits it here. So the flood plain runs along the length of the river which is 1300 kilometers. It's five kilometers on each side and here it is about 80 meters deep and it's all sand. And as you will see from the experiment with the glass of dry sand and water, that if we take equal levels of dry sand and water and we start pouring the water into the sand, half the water goes into the sand. So what basically you're saying is that um, this is a model for sustainable development where the water will actually, if you, if you plan it out well, you'll be able to store a lot of water under underneath this, uh, underneath these sandbanks. I mean, for in layman's terms. It's, it's naturally stored. So we were looking for a new source of water. And when we looked at this, you can actually pull out, as I was wanted to finish what I was saying, on a glass it may be at half the sand volume, it fills with water. But on the flat plain, because of compactification and gravity, it's less, it's about 35 to 38 percent of the total volume, which is huge. 1300 kilometers long, 10 kilometers wide, 80 meters deep. And actually you can pull out 12 percent of this volume which would satisfy more than half the needs of the city of Delhi. But when you do that, you have to be very careful. Because if you pull out that much, will the poultry rain that we get, 60 centimeters a year, and the poultry flooding because the river is overexploited and overused, will it be able to replenish this? The answer is no. It can replenish only about one-sixth of this at most. So 2%. But 2% already if we look at Delhi, 50 kilometers of river, can give us up to 300 million cubic meters of water, which is one quarter of the total supply to Delhi, and be replenished naturally. So the first thing we had to look at was a sustainable supply of water. And so we decided that these cities have to, in India, be put near the floodplain. And the floodplain, at least three kilometers wide around the city, must be sacrosanct, that is your water source. Then we put a chessboard kind of city in which the white portions are the built-up areas and the black portions are the green areas. And what we did was that in a city like this we found that if we leave three kilometers at the bottom of the city downstream to recycle the water because we don't want to put bad water into the river, then that can be used as pasture land for cows. And the three kilometers of the floodplain can be used as it is over here, as you notice, to grow organic vegetables so that you don't pollute it with fertilizer and pesticides. And then you only need, if you have a 15 kilometer by 15 kilometer city, okay, you have more than 100 square kilometers to play around with with parkland. And if you put 25 to 30 square kilometers of berries, 25 to 30 square kilometers of pasture, you have a good 30 square kilometers of parkland. And this city will be self-sufficient now on water, vegetables, and milk. Now, all along, just like the bishop runs in a, in, a, in a chessboard, along the green areas, you can have bicycling paths covered with uh, trees, which will be non-stop. And since from the center to the end of the city is about seven kilometers or seven and a half, it will take you very little time by bicycle to get there. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and in, by car it will take you the same amount of time. So it will become a pleasure for people to commute and you cut down on the transport. In any case, in Delhi, as you know, that it takes, you're always doing 15 kilometers to go from here to there with the traffic jams and the pollutions, the time taken is huge. But what we are really so talking about... Let me, let me just finish this. I just want to finish this for a moment. Uh, so what, the distance you have to travel is less than half. The amount of green area per person goes four times up. So one-eighth is the level of pollution and one-eighth 
is the health, eight times better is the health index because that's plenty of parks, good air. Now what happens is that why are we doing this? Because we want to bring the temperature of the city down in the summer. And the green areas do photosynthesis. The built up areas get hot and give you low pressure. Pulling in air from the green areas, which is cool, cools down the whole place by about two to three degrees. Then there's blue convection. This is green convection, blue convection from the river. The river temperature is more or less constant. And if we have alleys going down from the river into the city, there will be cool air coming from the city into the river also, wherever, whatever are the areas which are built up, where the pressure becomes high and the air rises up. So green convection, blue convection, insulated housing, insulated bricks or insulating walls, and reflecting surfaces or solar cells on the ceiling will bring down the temperature of the city in the summer by 7 degrees and also keep it constant in the winter. So that's a huge saving on the energy the city needs. Okay, so we've got the transport, the health, all this done. So as sustain, in terms of sustainability, this city on these eight counts gives you about 85%. And Delhi scores something like 4%. So you can see the difference of living in a city like this and living in a big city like Delhi. And then costs, because there's so many costs for a bigger city, the amount of things that have to be brought in, transported in and out, time lost in traffic jams, pollution, health costs, at least it's one th and the rental cost, at least it is one third of the cost and the total consumption required in a place like Delhi. So that was the idea. No, but are we really ready for something like this? I mean, critics are going to say that, you know, this is a model that is going to be extremely difficult to put in place, especially in a country with limited resources like India. No, it's not. It's precisely for India. Because we don't have other resources, that's why we're putting the cities next to the floodplain, like there, or there. And if it's self-sustaining, it's the only way it can run. So for a million people, we need just 15 kilometers of floodplain. And it's the only way with the expected urbanization that we'll be able to handle it. Because if it is not self-sustaining, like Delhi, it's going to prey upon the Himalayas to get its water resources. It's going to prey upon the entire area because it has to import everything. So th that's precisely why we worked out on this model, which is self-sustaining. But I started with the idea that it has to be self-sustaining. And we've got this fantastic sustainability index. And it's not a big deal for a million people to live in a 15 kilometer by 15 kilometer area. Professor Sony, tell us a little bit about the theory um, that you have come up with for sustainable extraction of water from the riverbeds. In this case, of course, Delhi. Okay, I just wanted to say that I explained to you that out of this resource, which is 38% of a volume, which is five kilometers wide, the length of the river that appears, and about 50 meters deep, you can actually pull out 12% of it. But unfortunately, we are not in a situation to recharge that 12%. So I am saying that if we pull out about 2.5% of that, something of the order of 250 million cubic uh, meters a year, we can recharge it by the rainfall over this wide area, and a wider area that comes and drains into the river and fills up the floodplain, and by the flooding, which gives you a two meter. You know, in the floods, the waters goes above where you can see that line, right. that uh, line where the motorbike is. At least two meters the water goes up in the flood, two and a half meters at least. And then what happens is that the river spreads and becomes very wide, over a kilometer sometimes in high flood level. And then the water goes to both parts of the floodplain that are on the away side also. This will fill up a large amount of the floodplain. Both these combined can actually and with the maximum water, uh, groundwater level, which will get diminished only by four meters, both these processes of recharge combined will bring you up to flush levels that you start with at the end of the monsoon. And then it will bring down the water by four meters and again next monsoon it will be back. So that's what I meant, that this is something which is totally impeccably ecological, totally non-invasive, local and perennial. 
So we can do about, I think, a fifth to a quarter of the supply of Delhi. You must realize that Delhi is such a huge city with 20 million people, it's one Australia, that it is not a normal city. But if you take cities like Allahabad, Banaras, Agra, Mathura, they can be completely sustained on flood plain water. And what about the costs associated with it? Are there any benefits to the city? Because that is something that every city is grappling with. How do you supply water at a reasonable cost to its population? This is what I'm saying, that the costs over here, you have when you do costs, you have to look at the supply of a commodity. And the only way to look at costs is to look at the tanker value of water. And if we pull out about 300 million cubic meters of water for Delhi, its tanker value is about 4,500 crores every year. That's what the revenue... For, for, for those of us who don't understand a tanker, the value of a tanker in Delhi is... Uh, 1,500 more, rupees 1500 for, to for 10, rupees a, 10 cubic meters. That is the rate going right now. Right. And large parts of the and city it's going, are already being supplied it's, by it, And it's going to increase as the water shortage becomes bigger. So if we switch to this, this water is worth 4,500 crores. You're not built for it right now. You will be in a few years. But if you were to recycle the water, which is what people are talking about, the used water, and you recycle it to the level of water that can be used in the, kinch, uh, in the kitchen, but not drunk. Okay, so just kitchen water for washing for vegetables and using things, but not potable, not drinking water, the cost will be at least two times the tanker value. And tanker water, remember, is going to run out because it's all coming from aquifers, which are not recharged like the river. They are local aquifers uh, in, inland. And if you carry on using it, there'll be nothing left very soon. Like Gurgaon does not have any groundwater left. So, you know, we, we start, as a city, as a people, we start using certain techniques or we start getting dependent on certain techniques. Are we ready for something radically different, even though the need of the R is that? But are we ready as a city and a people? Well, but we are already, some of these wells are already being used. I don't know what you mean by ready. I mean, if somebody says, I'm going to give you 4,500 crores of free water, you're not going to ask the question, am I ready to receive it? Because you're not putting it in a bank, you're putting it inside you. No, in terms of, uh, is is the city investing in that? I mean, are they are, we don't are, need, they, are we, they interested in what you're saying right now? We need very little investment. You know, this little project of 100 million cubic meters called the Palla Yamna Floodplain Sustainable Water Project is going to give you 100 million cubic meters, which is worth 1,500 crores a year. And you know what the total investment in it is to make it completely automated for sen sen sensors at each well which will check salinity, fluorides, nitrates, everything and groundwater level with piezometers all go to a central computer and the central computer controls the pumping optimally. Do you know how much the total cost is? It's about 12 or 13 crores. And it'll give you 1500 crores in a year. So there's not much point in talking about it. It's really, there's something called a free lunch over here. Oh, free it's water free water. 